Well, we want to welcome you all again today around to the round table and we're excited as we always are every week for what the Lord's about to say to us. So we'll go straight into our, our time together and we're going to ask precious uh, sister Pamela to open us up in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you and bless you and come before your throne in the name of Yeshua. This day, uh, all of us around the table and we are awaiting your presence, anxiously awaiting all the wonderful things that you desire to impart to us through your word this day, especially in these chapters of Deuteronomy. And so open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes and ears, Lord, that we may be able to understand your word and really take it to heart and learn to apply it. And so we just Commit this roundtable into your hands. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you and to be together again. We are on a wilderness journey here. I don't mean literally. We're studying the book of Deuteronomy, and we're in chapter 8. And what I meant by that was we are not the, gener the wilderness generation that, that we're reading about and studying. But during the years that I've been reading and studying the scriptures, I've often pondered God's dealings with Israel during this wilderness period of Israel's history. And during the stages of the wilderness journey from Egypt uh, to the promised land. And for some time, yeah, I say more than 40 years because I've been following the Lord more than 40 years. I believe that it was written as a kind of a, a memorial or a, a textbook, so to speak, for future generations. And so I think this generation now is a very important, this book of Deuteronomy is a very important book for both Israel and the church. Uh, not only for Israel, but also for the church to be instructed and to be admonished and to be encouraged and even to be warned because we're all in this together. Um, I'm going to begin by reading something from, let's say, let's turn, let's turn instead of Deuteronomy 8, let's turn to chapter where is it in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10? And Pastor Dennis <clears throat> and Pastor Rosemary, which of you would like to begin for us in chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians? This is just a little background for us. I had something in my heart I wanted to speak about before we get into the actual okay. reading of the text. Verse 1. I want you to read 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as also they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the age have come. Now that verse 11 is the special verse that jumps out and speaks to us. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, but he's saying now these things referring to the wilderness journey 
happened unto them by way of example, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come, the ends, the end of the age, the end of the ages has come. The wilderness journey is um, that we're studying. In other words, it's the history of Israel. It was very significant for Israel. Paul thought it was very significant for the Corinthian believers, the book, and, and then also important for us today because these things were, re, were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age has come. You following me? Yep. And so this is a, a now word for us. And so let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and let's see what it was that he was referring to here, where we're talking about remembering the Lord. Rosemary, Pastor Rosemary, you're going to begin for us reading, let's just begin verses 1 and 2. Let's take this real slowly today. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way for 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Beautiful. What does it mean by every commandment which I command you today? <clears throat> Pamela, do you know what that's talking about? Well, it's every, uh, everything that God commanded Moses on the mountain, for one. And then, of course, uh, as we recently read about the great commandment, uh, you know, hear, O Israel. Right. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you one. shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your might. And what else does that speak to you about? All the commandments, the Ten yes. Commandments, and the 609? 13. 13. 13. I keep on making up new numbers. 613 <laughs> commandments, which nobody can keep. But nevertheless, the Lord God has given us this to remember him and every commandment that he has spoken to us through his word. But verse two is the key verse, Rosemary. What does it say? You shall remember what? You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what is in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. All right, now we've established from what we just read in 1 Corinthians 10 that we're all on a wilderness journey, so to speak. Um, some of us maybe haven't lived 40 years following the, 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 the Lord yet, and others have lived for 40 years and have followed the Lord, and others for more than 40 years. But it's a, a type for us to learn from and to be admonished from. Um, the wilderness is an extraordinary place. It, 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 God's purpose here, it says, was to humble and test you and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. What is this humbling and testing uh, all about anybody who has an idea what God was after by humbling Israel and bringing them to a place where they could do nothing but depend upon him. Don't forget, this is not the generation that lived in Egypt. This is the generation that grew up in the wilderness and followed the Lord for 40 years. Yes, Pamela. So they knew... Um... They, they learned, they, they uh, experienced hunger and God gave them manna. They experienced thirst and God gave them miracles of water. 
and uh, to teach them and to um, help them to understand that it was God doing the whole thing from taking them out of Egypt, bringing them to Sinai, giving them the, the, um, the covenant, making the covenant, creating a nation out of them, and then bringing them through this treacherous journey through uh, a land without water and without food. And he kept them all along the way. And, uh, you know, when you, when you go, when you are suddenly lacking in the basic needs of existence, and then uh, some, and then the, that help is given to you, there is a humbling process. You realize that it's not you who, who, uh, uh, who let's see, I'm, I'm trying to get the right grammar. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't you who uh, did the work, so to speak. And, and the Lord is really trying to press in on that, to show them that they are utterly dependent upon him. And so that's want, a humbling process. So I want, I want you to consider, Pamela, what does it mean by, what was the purpose of, in God's heart and his dealings with Israel uh, that Moses is speaking, that you shall remember all the way that the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, rem uh, that I'm sorry, I uh, I couldn't hear you hear you exactly. Oh, all right. I want to know the purpose. What do you think the wilderness journey? The, what what particular purpose was in the heart of God in His dealing with Israel? Uh, that he tells us to remember all the way that the Lord led us for 40 years in the wilderness to humble us and to test us to know what was in our hearts. Right. I want um, to tell us a little bit. What is it like about being in the wilderness for 40 years? It must be a breaking process, don't you think? Yes. Well, you. what happens is all the things that you thought you needed or wanted they're taken away from you, and then you learn to be accustomed to not having any of that. And you're, you're, uh, there's nothing to distract you from relating to the Lord. And uh, so it's building a relationship with the Lord is what it is. In other words, no television, no Facebook, no Twitter, all of that stuff, right? Nothing. Just the Lord <laughs> and his tabernacle and his okay. presence hallelujah yes <laughs> you know rosemary you're laughing i was thinking you know you you affectionately called me when we was when we were studying the book of uh, exodus you, you 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 said i was like like a moses because of my age i'm sure that's what you meant <laughs> not 120 years old yet so i was thinking about it so that would make pamela my sister she would be miriam and Rosemary, you would, of course, be, what do you think? Caleb, of course, give me oh. this mountain. <laughs> and Dennis would undoubtedly be. Wait for it, wait up. for it. <laughs> 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 so we have the awesome four here. Oh, God. A little, a little humor here. Beware not to forget the Lord your God. That's what it's all about. Mm. Remember all the way that the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you and to know what was in your hearts. All right. And his purpose was to really, it was the school of the Holy Spirit, I think. Mm. Yeah. If you want to, you know, Andrew Murray used to write these books uh, about the school of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh, the school of prayer and the school of uh new you know praying and and serving and seeking god i think that that's what god was teaching us us for 40 years because it's not only for the israelites for 40 years it's for us yeah we live in the end of the age yeah. let me hear from you dennis let me hear from you rosemary what have you got to say about this wonderful I, verse it's pregnant with stuff i think it was also 
uh, very, very important they remember because number one, he wasn't seeing these people as a separate people. He saw them all as part and parcel of the people, Israel. So he wanted them to remember and, because only God knows what's in our hearts. We think we know, and some of you don't want to know what's in our hearts, but they had to constantly remember because if they didn't remember what God had done and where they were coming from, going into the blessings, they could become proud. They could, and, and as we read on, you'll see, he wanted them not to say, we did this of our own admonition. We did, we did this of our own ability. They had to always remember it was God. And so he let them go through testings. He, he put them through testings. He put them through difficult things so they would know that he's God and have a point of reference. Yes. So it, it, remembering was very, very important. And God knew what the people were like when they forgot, what they got up to when they forgot. And they had a tendency of remembering the wrong things like the leeks and the garlics and all that sort of stuff. Oh, yes. They, they forgot the hardship of, of Egypt when things were getting hard and difficult in the wilderness. God wanted to remember that he was their God. He had made a promise to their forefathers, and he was going to keep that promise. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, yes. I think also, too, that the, the, the whole... This whole chapter actually is is based on a warning against pride, uh, mm. and, and so mm -hmm. so in it when we when we're reading the chapter, uh, as God takes them through this process and His warnings, uh, He's actually telling them and showing also to us today, the only appropriate posture uh, to before God is humility. Mm. That's the posture. That's the pro the only. And as we as followers, uh, he gives more grace to the humble, uh, but he, he, he resists the proud. And actually the greatest enemy in the kingdom of God is within the kingdom of God is pride. The greatest so that, enemy. So that's, the great. why, that's why he humbled them. Yeah. 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 Mm. And that's why he keeps on like, putting them through mm. tests mm. to see, so they could see, he yeah. knows what was in their heart, but mm. for them to see what was in their own heart. Mm. So he but tested it, them, he humbled them, he took away all of their mm -hmm. self, uh, uh, self-sufficiency. They had to trust in God as their father. They had to trust in God as their creator, as their provider. Don't yeah. forget, he fed them for 40 years, manna from, mm -hmm. from, from heaven. And I think and he had to, minutes, yes. Yeah, I, I think he had to, like even with us, it, it, this kind of process, is one to keep remind us that it's a privilege to be his chosen people mm -hmm. uh, and, and to remember that it's him that actually provides, uh, but there is a price for being his chosen people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's the word. And, 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 and that means that price is that we must rely on him, rely on him uh, and his provision. Because as soon as we get blessed or whatever, it's, it's automatic. The first thing that happens is, is that we'll start getting yeah. puffed up in ourselves. So, so, so the price to pay is to always to remember that he is, uh, he is the provider. And so mm, if we, if the moment we forget who, we, who he is, we just, we just move into pride <laughs> straight away. And Moses was very different than, than, than the wilderness generation, of course. Mm. Moses was called the servant of the Lord. Mm. Uh, he discerned the ways and purposes of God in all his dealings and guiding with the people. Um, and for the most part, they only saw their difficulties. Mm. But Moses saw beyond that. He saw that the testings and the humblings and the breakings were God ordained in order to teach them to look to him and to trust in him and not in themselves, mm -hmm. like they did maybe in Egypt, who knows, even though they were slaves. Mm -hmm. But this generation weren't slaves. And, it, and it's, so, it's so easy that once you have God as your provider, it's so easy then to succumb to the, to the, the pull of conceit. And I guess that happened right in the Garden of Eden. Yes. It has been that way ever since. Mm -hmm. Because once God starts to provide for us, we can become very conceited. 
Uh, and that's the, that's the tool that the serpent uses. Did not God say, or just, just to bring us to the place of pride. So this is a very special chapter. It's really good to go through it like this. So he's crucifying the pride and he's, mm. he's, he's teaching them humility. Mm. Okay. Um, Pamela, you want to read verses three and four for us? So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. So read you verse, should read verse five also. Okay. So you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. All right. So what do you get out of that? One of the most important ways that God humbled and dealt with Israel in the wilderness was that he let the people hunger is that correct he allowed yes the hunger yeah the it, it, there were no the options for the people at all which is also god's provision preventing them from having any options so that they were literally hungering and then he fed them manna so there was no bread there was no food to eat no, nothing else to eat only manna so he led them and fed them with manna, which was unknown to them and unknown to their fathers. Right. What was this provision of manna, Pamela? This a special uh, substance that came down out of heaven. A miraculous, a miraculous substance. Yes, it was a, it was a supernatural manifestation of this substance that came every uh, night. So they woke up in the morning and then they gathered it and they couldn't keep more than what they could eat in a day. So they were learning not only to, it, it, it's just amazing it, when you think about it, what he taught them. What do you think he was, he was teaching them? To, to completely trust in the Lord day by day. But read the verse you, that, that you read. Don't you remember what you read? That man shall not live by bread alone. Okay. <laughs> That's what you're getting at. Yeah. You know what it says? Read <laughs> verse three. Okay. End of verse three. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. Okay. Fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I think that's interesting. I wanna look that in Hebrew because it's, uh, it's almost like a piece of poetry. Well, you know, last week we mentioned that uh, Jesus himself quoted uh, this verse in Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse three that we're just reading now. He declared mm -hmm. that uh, every one of us ultimately are dependent not on bread alone, but on God, the giver and the provider of life. Um, that the Messiah lives not uh, by material bread only. The Messianic uh, believers, the Christians, those who are followers of Jesus, but we live by doing the will of God and trusting in his provision. That's what it means. Yes. Mm. Part, well, of, part of what it means. I mean, provision, but also leading guidance, uh, yes. uh, shepherding our hearts, um, building our character, uh, shaping us as people, all of it is done by the lord not not just feeding us but mm. every thing from the time we're conceived mm -hmm. psalm 139 and especially from the time we start following the lord right so so 
the God, so complete being completely dependent upon the the word of God and, and his ability to provide for us that's that's a hard lesson for us to learn isn't it mm. and he's forming a nation that is supposed to be dependent on God mm. so much so that the nation is supposed to to have a relationship with god and he chose to do it by by giving them the means was he gave them mana from heaven yes i mean what a humbling way of dealing with people right it took away all food and gave them manna to eat which Isn't totally uh, was sufficient for them and they had to learn that yeah you, you can you imagine the complaining and the wailing hmm. that went on of course, I can remember. I can. We have it today in our land uh, as it is today with all of the abundance we have. But Jesus came and he taught us by means of uh, the, this story that his food was to do the will of his father. Yeah, and that's something that we all have to get to, to, to understand. And I think it's, it, it makes it easier to get it when we actually come to realization that we never ever receive anything for our spiritual life from our feelings. Absolutely. Isn't that's that a, true? That's a profound statement. Isn't that true? Really? I think it is. Once you get that realization, because you know, in, in our Christian walk and our walk with the Lord, we're, we're bombarded with different thoughts. We've been bombarded with, with different feelings. And we start to think, is this the right feeling? Is that the wrong feeling? But once you come to realization that you, <laughs> you'll get nothing for your spiritual life, govern on your feelings, it helps you alleviate a lot of uh, other, other, other thoughts and that. And it brings you to that focal point where we realize that we cannot, we cannot live by this. When we say bread alone, it was wonderful how you just unpacked the many different aspects that we can rely on and trust on, but we can only totally lean and trust on Him and receive life, spiritual life. <laughs> uh, by it. you can't, we can't receive it any other way. Mm. Mm. Even you, you think how easy it is to get tempted into saying, "Well, I feel the Lord is saying this," or "I feel." <laughs> We must know what he's saying. Yeah. You, you, you can't enhance your spiritual life by, well, I feel God may be telling me something. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how we get fed in our spirit. Your feelings cannot feed your spiritual life. That's right. That's right. exactly right. <laughs> that's why when we worship, we must worship in spirit and in truth. Rosemary, can you add to the, the conversation here? Well, I, I was sort of meditating on verse five, so I don't know. Oh, talk to us about it. I was, I was thinking as I was reading verse five, um, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. I was thinking uh -huh. about the, the thought that the Lord uh, saw these people as his children. In Exodus chapter 4, 22, he says, Israel is my son, uh, even my firstborn. And also in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Mm. And so God having this father relationship with his children, his son, um, we know that when a father loves his child or his children, he will discipline his children. He will chasten his children. And I was thinking about that, how God had to uh, discipline them. And when we think of discipline, we think of punishment for something you've done wrong or disobedience. But it was, it's not, there's, there's not so much more to discipline than that. It is, it's like he, he had to give them instruction. He loved his children. He, was, he greatly loved them. And he wanted to instruct them how to... Uh, enjoy the freedom he was bringing them into. They had been in bondage in Egypt for all those hundreds of years. Now he brought them out and uh, they were going to have this freedom, but they had to know how to use the freedom responsibly. 
And so that's why it's called, they have to constantly remember it is God. Because when, if you let children have freedom and you don't give them instruction or guidance, they can just go away <laughs> overboard. And so he says, as a man chases his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. He's, he's going to he discipline, he's going to discipline them. He's going to instruct them. He's going to show them the way they have to go. And, and, and it may seem like punishment to them, but he's actually wanted to develop them to bring them to adulthood. Oh, right. that's good. That's good. And I, and, 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 and I think that's for all of us. God wants to bring us to that place of maturity. So we have to remember where we're coming from. We have to remember who he is and be totally dependent on him. And as we were saying how he, he provides for us, he feeds us, he clothes us. He, he will meet all our needs. We have to have that confidence in him to know that our heavenly father will provide our needs. Or he knows what we need better than we know. And so here is God speaking to his people and saying, you are my son, my firstborn. My inheritance I'm giving to you. I am going to provide for you. I am going to keep you. I am going to instruct you in the way that you should go so that I will be glorified and that it will be good for you. It's all about God's glory mm -hmm. and about the blessings he wants to put on upon his, his people, the inheritance he's given to them, that they maintain and keep that inheritance. And I think that's really, really powerful. It's very beautiful. It's not going to be an easy ride. If a father loves a child, they're not going to give the child every single thing they ask for uh, or wish for because the father knows what is best for that child. But the, ch the father has good plans for the child. The father wants that child to come to a good end. He knows the way to steer them. So here's God telling the people, remember me, obey me, love me. I love you. You're my firstborn. I'm going to provide for him. I'm not going to let you down at any point. Just trust me. Yes, yes. And you hit it. You hit the nail right on the head. Go ahead, Dennis. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about this whole thing about this whole chapter, consistent of God addressing pride. And um, I made a statement, and I said about you know, our, 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 we can't trust uh, our emotions. The life source must be God's word. Uh, can I just take a couple, read a couple of verses? I think it's very important because last week you actually picked up on this, and. Um, when Jesus himself said, man shall not live by bread alone, and he was dealing directly with Satan. He was dealing directly with the one who came in the garden and, 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 and got uh, Adam and Eve to, to give away all that they had by just not taking heed to the word of God. Uh, and in Jeremiah chapter 23, look, look, look I'm, I'm just thinking about the times that we're living in right now. And all the things that have been said and done uh, in the name of God, and even with uh, we, even us in teaching and, and speaking the word of God, we've got to make sure that we don't mix our thoughts and our and our <laughs> and what we want to say in it. It says in verse twenty eight, it says it's very interesting. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. Then it goes and says, but and he who has my word. Let him speak my word faithfully. I've got this marked in my Bible from a long time ago. What, what is the chaff to the wheat, <laughs> says the Lord. There's a comparison between that which is coming from a prophet <laughs> and a prophet's word and whatever he has to bring and God's word. And it says um, uh, in verse 20, 29, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Oh, yes. And then look at this. Look at verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord. The prophets who steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them, 
or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. This is the time that we're living in right now. And the Bible says in the last days, we'll have all kinds of false prophets raise up and even taking God's word. So we've got to have an ear to know and be able to discern the word that we've got to live by. And uh, man shall not live by bread alone. And that, that bread alone is not like Pamela picked up. It's not just about eating or, or stuff, substance. It's, it's philosophies. It's the, the theologies. It's all, uh, you know, it's all other things that people are coming up with. The word of God. The word of God. And I think there's a, I think there's a kind of real quickening thing here that's happening um, in, in the day that we're in right now. That Lord, help me. Help me, Lord God, not to be proud. This whole thing is about about being proud. It's all, it's all, it's all how, how, about pride coming through God's provision. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we, none of us know the wilderness that we're going to have to go in, into in the coming days so that we'll be tested. <laughs> so he gets his, his full due back. Uh, and so I think that's very, it's very, very powerful. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, so much. Excellent. And I'm going to just return to what we were speaking about again in uh, Rosemary about the chastisement um, scriptures. Um, that that in, in Judaism, uh, actually, even in, 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 in Christianity, the, the, the idea of discipline, the discipline of God has to do with the dealings of of God loving his people. It's called the Yasurim Shel Ahava, the chastisements of love. That all of God's ways and judgments and chastisements uh, for Israel, above everything else, is his love for his people. That he loves them with an unspeakable love. And he's dealing with Israel, he's dealing with the church. Uh, to reveal to us a father's most intimate dealings. I was looking at this verse in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 and 6 that says that uh, my son do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. That's what you're talking about, Dennis, in, uh, in Jeremiah's time. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges, it says in this version, every son whom he receives. So he's a chastening God. He's a discipline, a disciplinarian God because he's our father. He loves us. He chastises everyone he accepts as a son and a daughter. So the trials and tribulations that are coming, no doubt, to Israel and to the nations uh, are not primarily for punishment, but for um, God preparing, in this case, he's preparing Israel to enter into the promised land. And in our case, God is preparing us to enter into the kingdom of God when the Lord returns and, and, and restores the kingdom. It's gonna be an extraordinary time for all of us. Uh, a difficult time. It's called uh, the Chevlei HaMashiach. What is that, Pamela? The birth pangs of the Messiah. Of the Mashiach. You have something to say, Pamela, to add to this? Well, just, uh, conversation? <laughs> it, just a small trinket that yes. um, the chastening of the Father and the Son is reflected in the Lord's prayer, if I'm not um, Speak. Uh, mistaken because we, uh, Jesus says, this is how you should pray. And then it's our father. So we're, we're, we're uh, turning to God as our father. So naturally we are the son and it, within the prayer, there is the lead us not into temptation. That is um, chastening. I, I believe chastening protects us very often from temptation. And then give us this day our daily bread. There's the manna uh, coming, however it's to come. So um, there are many things within that prayer that reflect 
out of what we're talking about now. Excellent. Rosemary, Pastor Rosemary, go take us a little further in verses 6 through 10. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Um, is it, is it down to where? Did you say down to 11 or? Uh, no, down to 10. To 10, okay. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. All right, so there it is. So we can't really know before the fact that God is educating and training us, uh, but the Bible tells us that he's preparing us for his eternal kingdom. And nevertheless, uh, we all have to go through our own wilderness experience. How many, how many, how many of us uh, ha are going through a kind of wilderness experience today? Can, can, can anybody raise their hand? Some of us are. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, probably all of us are in the last two years. There's no question in my mind. It's been a wilderness experience for, for me to navigate through. But um, the Bible tells us that he's preparing us like his disciples and that uh, we have to endure these, the, the, it's called chastisements of love and discipline if we really want to become like Jesus and be sons and daughters of God. So what I'm saying is I want, I want you to get in touch with your own wilderness journey experiences like, like we are here in Israel and like you are in London because it's one of the most important lessons that we can learn in following the Lord's path for us in the end, he's preparing us for the end of the age. This is not the beginning of our journey. We're coming closer and closer to the end of our journey. And uh, my gosh, the last seven years will really be death to self, believe me. <clears throat> Trust me. <laughs> but ultimately, may God have his way with us. He can choose anything which he pleases. And we want to submit ourselves to him. Okay, um, let's move on then. We covered that. What about verses 11 through 17, Dennis? Are you, are you ready to read to us? <clears throat> Back in uh, chapter 8 of uh, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Beware that you do not forget the Lord, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his judgments and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the, the great, sorry, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness, in which were, were fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hands have gained me this wealth. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's talk about this one. Something is happening in the wilderness to the Israelites that's going to leave, uh, that's left a mark upon them. Don't forget, Moses is speaking to them in his 40th year. 
in their 40th year, he's now 120 years old. So he's speaking like a father to his children and he's got something very important to say to them. The whole book is going to testify of what deep things he's imparting to them. So um, I want to encourage everybody that when something happens to you in the wilderness journey and it leaves a mark uh, for the rest of your life, it's like an inner secret thing that you went through with the Lord. It's deep and it's inner and it takes place in your life. You're going through it. We're going through it, all of us. Uh, if you haven't been in touch with it yet, get in touch with it today. It's been a process that we're going through. Uh, and uh, there's a, it's, we're coming out of something now, hopefully, into the next shaking that's going to take place. And it's all good. Isn't it, Pamela? You know all about this. You've been in Israel for 40 years now. My goodness. This is your 40th year, by the way. I know you think it's a few more days than that. A few more years than that, but all right. Tell us. Never something. mind. Tell us about your journey. No, no. I um. Well, okay. The verse seven and eight yeah, is my cool. journey. It, it, um, it. Okay, so for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. That's number one. It's a good land. It has water. All right. Mm. It's not a desert. It has water. Okay. All mm -hmm. kinds of water sources. That's number one. And number two, this is really interesting about this list of foods because every single one of these uh, crops depends upon the rain from heaven. It can, it, it, you, it, we're going to read it in Deuteronomy 11, but uh, the wheat and the barley and the grapevines and the fig trees and the pomegranates and the olives and the dates, this is uh, date honey, uh, they all, all of these trees and, and plants, they depend only on the rain that comes from heaven and it, uh, they don't have irrigation to uh, water them. So it's actually, God is setting them up. He's, he's saying, okay, you're, you're coming into this good land and you have these wonderful things to eat but you're going to have to trust me for me to water these things. So even God is providing, instead of manna, they're getting these seven varieties, which is going to be the basis of their diet. So it's still trusting in the Lord. It's still like manna in a way. And uh, these seven varieties, they're, uh, they're used as symbols in the synagogues today uh, throughout, you know, in the architecture and decoration and so forth, even in the temple, they were used because these symbolize the trust that Israel had to have in the Lord. Well, thank you, thank you, Pamela. Verse 18, read that to us, Pamela. And you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Okay, talk about it, all of us. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. It is he that establishes his covenant, which he swore to his, your fathers. It's, this is just the opposite of the world, worldly thinking. Because, yes, talk about it. you know, um, when, when you read this to get wealth, people, uh, I mean, all of us uh, in our human frame of thinking, our fallen flesh, as it were, what, the immediate thing is let's make a business plan and let's scheme, let's develop schemes. But that's not what the Lord is saying. He's saying, I'm the one who gives you the ability to get wealth. So you, the way we have to go about uh, a business plan as, as uh, believe, uh, being children of God is we have to go to the Lord first and we have to ask him, is this what you want me to do? 
and how, what do you want me to do and how do you want me to do it you know it's it's quite interesting and it's also the back the back door to allow pride to come in again because when we do something good we feel that we you know i've done this and you know and, and you know it wouldn't have been done without me look how good i done it and whatever pride will come in again mm. and he's saying it is it is he who gives you the power to get well it's amazing he is the source so it's a continuous exhortation to remember the Lord your God. And then it's just one example after another, after another, after another. So if we look at our own lives and our own journey, our old, each of us is on a wilderness journey. We, none of us have, have entered the promised land, so to speak, fully. Some of us may have begun to tip, you know, we, we may be getting to the point where we are getting to the to, to that place, uh, but it's going to happen before the Lord returns. There's no doubt in my life, but uh, no doubt in my mind, but my life hasn't arrived there yet. And um, I'm still being disciplined continuously. This is a great verse, Pamela. Remember that the Lord your God has, he is he who has given you power. No, he's the one who has given you uh, uh, prosperity or authority or whatever you want. Even to the job, even the job that even you might the job have, that you have, might have. You know, to to get a job that. You know, it depends upon the Lord. He's 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 actually the boss. You know, when when it comes to our work, in in uh, in a day or how we get through life i think also to be fine for believers today also the the riches that we have in christ jesus the the, the we've got the the riches of his grace the riches of his glory we've got the riches the unsearchable riches in christ it means to come to a place where we understand that we are complete in christ and so even if we feel that we are um going through a dry place or the will as it were we have we have Christ in us and he and we have all that wealth that's been all the fullness of him that dwells within us so we've got everything that we need just as just as God was telling the people of Israel you know he's talking to Canaan land everything is in that land and it's wonderful it starts with the water because in the east water was such a scarcity and we've got jesus christ the living water in christ we have everything and i think as believers it's, it's, it's it typifies all of that all the wonderful things that god has planned for each of his children he's provided all that we need it's all fulfilled in the plan yes so he's blessed us because he's fulfilling his covenant yes plan and purposes and everything he's doing is ultimately good for his eternal purposes. And he's, he's also speaking to them and saying, yes, I've, I've, I've made this treaty. I've made this pact with your forefathers. But, you know, th these are conditions that you uh, must meet so I can establish this pact. Because he says it, doesn't he? He says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore. So the covenant was, it's all written up, it's all laid there, but he wants to establish it. And it's, it's like all the promises that we have. There's lots of promises that we have, but we've got to meet the conditions so the pact, the covenant can be established, can be activated. There you go. <laughs> My, oh, my. And look what happens, Dennis. Finish the chapter. Read from verses 19 through 20 and see what happens uh, again. Probably the whole pride thing is going to come up again, but read it anyhow. <laughs> then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys 
before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Hmm. He loves us so much. He loves us beyond our comprehension. And he goes and he goes out of his way to put everything in place. But there's certain things he can't do. That's why our, our great emancipator had to say, not my will, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. There's got to be that yielding. Yeah, yeah. Well, so he's preparing them for the seven nations that they're going to be um, coming against, which we'll read mm. about next week, uh, when uh, they are going into the promised land. Mm. Yes. And um, mm. all of this is preparation. Mm. God is dealing with them in a way that uh, there'll be no pride because God will go before them and God himself will defeat. Yeah these nations and drive them out of the land so again um let's just kind of uh my goodness let's look at our own personal wilderness journey again with the lord uh, and our own testings and our own whatever we find ourselves in today um jesus Lord, you know everything about us. You know everything that's going on in our lives. You're present here in the wilderness. You're present here in this round table. And Lord, as we're coming to a close, thank you for all of the wonderful things that you have done in this wonderful time uh, that you've given us. And uh, Rosemary, pray for us. Pray for us for his name's sake that something truly will take place in the midst of the church that you're pastoring. Give, give a blessing to everybody today and uh, let's all open up our hearts to this prayer. Go ahead, Rosemary. Lord, I wanna thank you so much because you took your time, even through your servant Moses, to remind your people over and over again what your expectations were and still are. Here we are, Lord, and in our day and generation, you still want to bless us. You still have so much more in store for us. And Lord, it's for us to come and humble ourselves that we can enter into the success that you want us to have in our walk with you spiritually and which will overflow into the natural realm of our lives. We wanna thank you, Lord. Help us not to reject your authority. Help us not to forget your goodness. And so, Lord, in by humbling ourselves and moving from our prideful ways, we can receive and enjoy everything that you have for us. Help us not to have un an ungrateful heart, because that's the place where sinful attitudes and appetites can be developed. But help us to have that spirit of humility and a heart full of gratitude towards you. We thank you for the blessings that you're pouring out upon us even now because we are your children and you love us and you have the blessings for us. You have, you have so much of the kingdom that you want us to embrace and enjoy because we are to be kingdom people. Lord, we tear away anything that may be an idol in our lives. We move it from that high place. And we ask you to sit upon the throne of our lives. Lord, we want to thank you because you are with us and you promise never to leave us. And you don't want us to be in a place of ruin. You want us to be in a place of blessings. And so, Lord, we reach out to you with our hearts, our minds, our entire being focused on you and we say lord come and take over that your blessings will be upon us richly and that we will enter into that place of true relationship with you where our flesh life our wants our desires 
totally melt away and where your will will be done in our lives and you will be glorified. We declare that over our personal lives, over the church, over our businesses, everything, every aspect of our lives, however we're turned, however we're cracked up to be, may you alone be seen and known in our lives. May you be glorified. Lord, you have so much for us. We have a great inheritance. It's all in Christ Jesus. So Jesus become Lord of all we pray. And we ask that today upon, over all of our lives for every one of us, wherever we be as your people. May your blessings be upon our lives and make it rich. And Lord, there'll be no sorrow for in you we will have joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. And so we have Sila for now. Yes. Amen and we'll amen. Pause and we'll think about that from now until next week. Yes. The Lord willing. And we'll pick up again in chapter nine. Thank you so much, Pamela and, and Shamal. It's always, as we always say, it's always wonderful being together. Wonderful and the way the Lord leads us by his Holy Spirit. It's been amen. another phenomenal session. And we're going to unmute. And uh, just greet everyone, and we're back same time, same place next week. God bless you. On mute. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Love you. Thank you. Thank you.